um, then see me and uh, see if that's something we can do. We'd like to get this on rotation, maybe. And we're working with Angel and Lori who are doing the other route. Uh, let me know so we can get that uh, started as soon as possible. And then one other area for you to pray. This is more of a prayer um, as well. Wednesday nights, we have a lot of children coming. Uh, you all know that. And so in the children's area, we have a lot of, we have two groups. We have a K through, um, K through second grade, the third through fifth grade. And we are, I don't know, 25 or 30 kids. Um, it's a little overwhelming. And so we are praying for some help. We've been asking for, uh, we need a man to step in in both classes. And after we prayed about it some more, we've come to the uh, prayer agreement among the children's leaders that we need to take the boys and form a boys class. Um, so that would require a couple of men, maybe three men, to join together and teach the boys that are in that area. So that way our lady teachers can focus in on the K through second grade girls and the, the third through fifth grade girls. Um, this will be a little different, guys, if you are praying about this, Lee, is I, I, I don't think we're saying Boy Scouts, I don't think we're saying Trail Light, I don't think we're saying Awanas, but we are saying, guys, we need to teach these little boys some things about life, uh, things that, that you're good at. I mean, I'm talking about how to, well, we don't need to teach them technology, the kids already know that. Um, but we, they can teach us, I think. But uh, we, we are talking about, you know, how to tie a, how to tie a lure onto a fishing pole, how to, how to start a fire without burning down the forest, how to fix your tires on your bicycle. I, I'm just, guys, we just these boys. I, I, I passed up three boys today picking up that usually come on Wednesday night. They looked at me and said, "No, nah, we come on Wednesday nights." But uh, I'm just looking at them and saying, man, there's boys out the kazoo in this town. Uh, we, we need to be praying about this. So I'm asking men, I've asked you to come and help Rhonda and Lori to teach the class, and that's falling on deaf ears. So maybe it's because you don't want to just sit in the class with the ladies, and I understand that. But guys, I'm telling you, out of your experiences in life, I think we can develop a curriculum that we can do this together teach these boys, and if in that, we'd still be teaching uh, the scriptures and uh, uh, applying what God's word teaches into life. So uh, we've been talking about older men teaching younger men. Now I'm talking about we also have responsibility for little boys. And there's about eight to 10 boys that I'm talking about that come on Wednesday nights right now. Uh, sometimes a little more, sometimes a few less. So that's, that's a prayer for you. Um, I wish we could start Wednesday night, but you're not ready yet. But I need some guys to look at us and how can I do this? All right. So please join us in that. We're we're at a, a great opportunity to help with these boys and invest in them. I got to um, Paul. I want to say thanks to Paul. I came in from driving in, in one of our classes. Our teacher was wasn't in there, so I had to, I came in. Paul was counting the the numbers. So. Paul was sitting there getting their names, and I come in there, so he and I taught the uh, third through fifth grade uh, children's class this morning. And as we were in there talking to them, quite interesting to, uh, to be there. And I said, yeah, I, give me the boys, but I don't know if I can handle the girls, okay? And I raised girls. Uh, so Lori, uh, Lori's you know, doing youth, and, and Rhonda is doing children, and Jennifer's doing children. And this morning, Lori's out and um, uh, Star filled in for you. Guys, men, where are we? Where are we? I need you guys. We got to step it up. So that's what I'm asking you to pray about with us. Let's, let's, let's do it. I, I'm not, I'm, I'm just saying we've got to join together and we're not doing this alone. Um, 
I'm not saying, well, Paul was down there, so maybe Paul's the one. I don't know. Paul was doing it. I don't know how. He was down there, and he said, I said, well, how'd you end up here? He said, I walked in, there was this room full of 12 kids, and, you know, nine girls, and I think three boys. And I thought, okay, Paul was doing it. No, do we put him in charge? No. But I'm thinking, well, there's one, you know, maybe there's one guy. And you all know the other day they were sitting there, Paul was on one end and Gene was on the other. So let, let's pray about this. Let's pray. So maybe we've, gone, we've been going about this backwards of just doing co ed and the children. And so maybe we need to split that up. And that's, I think that's where we're at. And so I'm starting worship with Lord, help us. Help us to keep on teaching the boys and girls and the youth. And I'm asking you guys, and I've already asked the men, and they're already starting to pray about who's the young man they can invest in. Well, men, as you're thinking about that, you're investing in a young man. You're also saying, hey, you know, we've got a need for you to help us. So let's pray about this. I've already talked to a couple other young men that are in the building. and So we're all joining together. But let's really focus our prayers and, uh, and that, that God will help us and, and the Spirit of God will work in their hearts, okay? So uh, I know many of you are already working different places. Keep that up. But I'm asking other men to keep thinking about this, okay? This is a great, it's not a problem. It's a great opportunity that God's blessed us with. So let me pray for us and we're going to continue on worship. Father, thank you for this day that we've set aside this morning to worship and honor your great love through Jesus Christ. And today as we lift up the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you will lift up men and women to honor and praise you and hear you call into their heart. Lord, they don't have to be qualified to do this work, but they have to be called. And Lord, I pray that you will call out the men in this body of believers to do the work that you call them and enable us older men to invest in the lives of these younger men in such a way that you will help us work together as brothers in Christ to teach these boys, these young men, the young men we see on the streets of our town that are without any kind of godly leadership. Father, help this church to be what you call us to be in Wilberton and beyond. And let us know, Father, that you are not pushing us out in front and watching us, but you are leading us through your word and through your spirit. Father, we won't be going first into the lives of these boys or into the lives of this community. But Father, we will be going where you are already witnessing and speaking and teaching and showing men and women, boys and girls, about your great love through Jesus Christ. Lord, help us now as we honor Jesus Christ through song that he will be exalted in our hearts. It's in Christ's name we pray. Well, gang, how many walked outside this morning and felt that little touch of fall in the air? Did you like that? Man, I tell you what, we've had a long, hot summer. And uh, God uh, give us a little bit of a blessing today. It feels sure we do. Sure we do. Give us a little touch of fall. Give us something to look forward to. And I tell you what, it's a blessing to have. Sharon, please go ahead. This week, is the starting of our prayer week for Edmund McMillan's state mission offering. And this is a special offering we take out to uh, help the needs within our state. And uh, you've got this, and you've got an envelope in your bulletin today. And this prayer drive doesn't give you a specific day by day, something specific to pray for. But it does emphasize several points that they want you to pray for and where the offering is being used um, with 
throughout our state. And one of them, we're going to be showing a film. I think when we take up our offering today, there will be a, a film shown about one of the needs. Last week, we saw one of the offerings that was being of the African American uh, churches that the giving helps them to, um, to grow their churches, to meet the needs within their community. And the other is the deaf ministry. And I noticed here it says 98 percent of deaf people do not know Christ. That's a big percentage. And uh, I know, you know, right now I don't think we have any need, but would there even be anybody here that can even do the sign language to show somebody here what the pastor's even saying? And in our bigger churches, I've noticed when I go to Tulsa, to my daughter's church at South Tulsa, they do have a deaf ministry. And they have someone that stands there and, and gives sign language about what's going on in the service. And that is what they want. They're needing the money to help encourage and, and help the deaf people know about the Lord. So uh, consider giving what the Lord, be prayerful about what the Lord, how to give uh, for the state mission program. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. Gang, I'm going to ask y'all to do something a little bit different today, and I hope that you don't throw a rock or the way to it. <laughs> but I'm going to, since our, our praise and worship service now is kind of split up, we sing hymns first, and we sing contemporary uh, songs after we take up the offering, I'm going to ask that we stand for both sets. If you don't feel like standing, I know that there's some mamas out there that uh, don't worry about it, but we can praise the Lord a lot better if we're standing, whether we're singing hymns or contemporary, so... Thank you so much. If you get tired, sit in. <laughs>
four rushers up here for passing our offense plates. Let's see. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to go ahead and just let my stand. Let's see. Let's see. Good morning, everybody. Aren't you glad for God's grace? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And as we come to this place that is called worship, understand that word worship with tithes and offerings. You know, uh, God's grace to us is so great. And there's a really powerful scripture in the Old Testament on giving, and it's found in Malachi 3, verses 8 through 10, where God accused the Israelites of robbing him. Amen. He said, you're robbing me. And so God's chosen people questioned this claim that the Lord said, and they said, how do we rob you? God's response was, by not making payments of the tenth and the contributions. Now, understanding we are in a New Testament age and that this tenth or tithe may or may not be applicable to the New Testament church, but also understanding generous giving is called from his church, right? We are to generously give. So let's just change this Old Testament scripture uh, to New Testament thinking, right? By not, God's response was, you're robbing me by not giving the contributions. So God goes on to make this powerful challenge in, in Malachi 3. Test me in this way. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. Without measure. Yeah. What a promise. What, what a promise from his graciousness, right? And it shows that living and giving leads to more blessings in our lives. Amen. And at the same time in Malachi, it talks about his people are accountable for the blessings that the Lord has bestowed upon them. Right. You've been blessed. Amen. You are accountable for those blessings to be used in God's kingdom. So let's look at some New Testament scripture, right? Luke 6, 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen. That's another promise that the Lord has given. What a promise that is. Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I talked to you the last time I spoke about this to you, about this scripture. These are Jesus' words, Right? So as the last time I spoke to you on giving, I'm going to ask you, where is your heart? Where is your heart? So, so basically, Jesus, uh, this is what Jesus is asking. Is your heart with me? Is your heart with my church? Or is it with the world? That's what Jesus is asking. Do you know that everything that we do here at First Baptist should be and is a part of our worship to our Lord? Everything that we do. Wednesday night meals, right? And all those kids, young folks, they're running around. We have classes on Wednesday nights, Sunday school, song services, preaching our business meetings should all be part of our worshiping the Lord. It's our giving. See, it's your giving that sponsors what we do. It's your giving is the reasons for some of these kids having, having the salvation brought to them 
and we've seen answers of yes to the Lord. We've seen kids and young people come to know the Lord because of these programs that we sponsor as a church. We preach and teach, right? The life, death, and burial and resurrection of Christ and what he's done for each and every one of us. And that amazing grace that we sang about, right? Uh, we've received that. And so we should give back this giving of his life for us. Amen? Amen. What an amazing grace there is. So our giving should be a reflection of our heart, what our heart treasures. Do your heart treasure your salvation? If your heart treasures your salvation, you will give so that others can treasure the same salvation, the joy of that salvation. Give in the light of what Christ has done for us on the cross and the amazing grace that we receive. Our giving should be a reflection of what is in our hearts, what we treasure in our hearts. So our giving should be part of our worship. And like I said, if you notice in the bulletin, it titles this worship with tithes and offerings. <coughs> so how do we do this? Those who follow Jesus should excel in the grace of giving. Giving is an expression of the love one has for Jesus. God loves willing and cheerful givers. A willingness is to be generous and giving is more important than the amount given, guys. It's how we give. Our giving will result in praise and thanksgiving to God, and our giving should be a natural response to God's gracious gift to us. So in the light of what Christ has done for us, why should we not want to give? Amen. Why should we not Want to give. Now, if you guys kind of want to keep up with the, the giving on, on your bulletin, if on the back page in the very bottom right hand corner, it gives a weekly running of what we give as a church. And if you look at last week, we done really good. Six thousand one hundred and fourteen dollars, and that is eighteen hundred and fifty dollars above what we needed for that week. The sad story is that usually in the weeks following, and we understand why the first week is, is the best, but in those weeks that follow, we have gone way down. To the point that we are $27,000 below our expenditures that we've had. And we are $31,000 below what we have budgeted for the year. Now you say, well then how are we operating? Because we had an emergency fund from the sale of the parsonage a couple of years ago, and that's what we've been working on. But if we continue at this same rate, uh, that's going to be gone. So if you need to see, guys, if you need to see where and how we spend our money, all our church expenses are out there for you to see. For you to see. And we encourage you. I would love to see this many people in our business meetings. And you should be part of our business meetings. You're part of this church. You need to be part of our business meetings. We want your ideas. So we encourage you to come to our business meetings. We want you to be a part of First Baptist Church's kingdom work. Yeah. Everything we spend here is part of God's kingdom work. Now I'm going to close with a really great scripture out of 2 Corinthians 9. In fact, I encourage you to read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and it talks about how our giving is worship to the Lord. But I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15 and I'm going to read the Amplified, all right? So starting in verse 6, it says, Now, remember this. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who shows generously that blessings may come to others. Our giving blesses others, right? Will also reap generously 
and be blessed. Let each one give thoughtfully and with purpose, just as he had decided in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Right? We don't, it's not just a box to check off of our spiritual checkbook. What is saying? So the giver and delights in those whose heart is in his gift. Verse 8, and God is able to make all grace, every favor and earthly blessing come in abundance to you so that you may always, under all circumstances, regardless of the need, have complete sufficiency in everything, being completely self-sufficient in him. Talking about the Lord. And have abundance for every good work and act of charity as it is written and forever remains written. He, the benevolent one, right, and the generous person talking about the Lord, scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. A little bit of commentary on this. Paul uses this scripture, Psalms 12, 9, 1, 12, 9, for what he has been saying about the divine principles of giving. God replenishes and rewards the righteous giver both in time, now, and in eternity. Verse 10, Now he who provides seed for the sower and bread for food will provide and multiply your seed for sowing, that is your resources, and increase the harvest for your righteousness, which shows itself in active goodness, kindness, and love. You will be enriched in every way so that you may be generous. And this generosity through us is producing thanksgiving to God from those who benefit. For the ministry of this service, this offering, is not only supplying the needs of the saints, God's people, but is also overflowing through many expressions of thanksgiving to God. Because of this act of ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to the gospel of Christ, which you confess, as well as your generous participation in this gift. For them and for all the other believers that are in need. And they also long for you while they pray on your behalf because of the surpassing measure of God's grace, right? His undeserved favor, his undeserved mercy and blessing which is revealed in you, in me, in his church. In verse 15, now thanks be to God for his indescribable gift which is precious beyond words. Amen. We have one more God fill in here and usher. Billy, thank you. Brother Gary, would you pray over this offering, please? Oh my God, thank you so much for letting us be here today. Thank you, Lord, that we have such a nice facility, Lord, to worship you in. I pray, God, that you will just help us all to search our hearts and look to where we're at, Lord, in our giving. I pray, God, that we would all give our, do our part and give for what we to be. And I thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, that you give us so much, Lord, and we pray that we'll be willing to, to give back to you what you deserve. And just bless, bless our service. Do not know Jesus. The deaf have never seen the name Jesus. Signs were explained. It's heartbreaking. Faith missions offering is going to fund ASL training for church members. We got to start with step one, and that is learning deaf culture and it's learning ASL. We are providing the funding for churches to get that training for their members so that when they have deaf people walk into their churches, they see somebody with a familiar face that can speak in their heart language. The second step is that Baptists will seek to partner and be that bridge between the hearing and the deaf in our state. That's really the ultimate 
goal. And we want them to come together for the gospel and to reach the dead. I think God's going to open doors outside of our churches just by knowing ASL. It's going to be far greater than anything we could ever imagine. We just have to be obedient to what God is calling us to do. sing a couple of more songs together. We did so good on those other two. Let's stand and sing two more. Thank you. 
His church, Father, find us ready, Lord God. Let every person that's in his place examine their hearts today. Are we ready for that day? Are we ready to see you coming back? Let us ask ourselves that, Lord God. And let's do everything that we can to make sure that we are ready for that day. Because we know without a doubt that you are coming back. And it could be any time. So, Father, let us examine our hearts. Speak to the hearts of everybody in this place today. Let them know the need for you in your life. Work through Brother Paul as he brings an anointed word to us. And he will give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, yes. Turn with me in the scriptures in the New Testament to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. What's that? 
Sometimes uh, when I say something early in the service, I'm like, oh Lord, that was a little bit too much. Um, so I hope I wasn't too much um, of Paul, and I hope it's every bit a part of what God wants you to hear. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the way when the preacher gets up, he's wanting to share the word, what God's been laying on his heart, and uh, speak in such a way today, we follow up from last week dealing with uh, servants and slaves and serving to today Paul picks up out of that servants go back basically and keep on serving but you're now set free in Christ to serve your masters even though you may still be uh, servants uh, still enslaved but you're not because you're now walking out of that part where you were lost and enslaved to sin to now you've been set free the greatest of freedom is when we are spiritually set free by what Jesus Christ has done for us and so he tells them to go back and live their life um, while they may be in bondage to a human master. They are now in, in, uh, in connection to Jesus Christ as the master who gave his life. But what a, what, a, what a picture of Jesus giving his life to set us free. And so he is our master as well as our savior. And so we follow him, we serve him. And so Paul just speaks to Titus and goes right to this passage uh, as we finish out chapter 2 in verses 11 through 15, and he speaks to us about what we've been singing all morning about grace. Uh, I've given this illustration, this acronym for grace, uh, one I learned, I don't still wish I could remember where it came from, but it was probably, probably somewhere in my youth years, I would guess, and I don't know if it was in a discipleship training class, or maybe it was, you know, I go back, this issue with men and boys and teaching this is not something new or or you know not uh, or uh, it's still a great meeting in our time but i remember we would come as youth and as men and preachers son and then there was like 20 it seemed like 10 or 15 teenage girls that were in a program back in the day called act teens which was a, a missions organization you had the, the boys and girls and then you, if your church was big enough sometimes you'd have this group for the uh girls called that teens and you know for like me because we never had that for the boys i don't know what it's called sharon you're gonna have to help me out do you remember i don't remember that they even all right so floral ambassadors but then what did the floral... i don't remember those names what was the crusaders was one of them one crusaders was the boys and ra's were the boys crusaders were part of the young but for the teenagers i don't think you ever had it if they did it would have been a big church and uh that's was, good. Was the girls that's yeah, and so I would come in, me and the preacher's son. We were the only two boys that would usually come on Wednesday nights, and so we would just we just hung around, and and I don't know if it's because there was ten girls there that we were hanging around on Wednesday nights, but we would do stuff and try not to get in trouble. Preacher's son and the deacon's son together in the area. You know, sometimes we could get in trouble, sometimes we didn't. Sometimes we were good, so but we were there on Wednesday night. So this issue is not something new. And so God's calling us. You know, you look around, God calls us. And so we're, I'm just saying the answer is not in the preacher's um, plea. And it's not in your saying, okay, I guess I'll have to do it because no one else is stepping up. I, I, I don't think that's it. I think it's, it's out of the grace of God. Amen. God's called us. And God's calling us as men and women to say, okay, God, it's not out of our, as much as we plead for the offering, the riches that comes to us is out of the grace of God. Amen. So our supply, there's never a want in the supply. God's going to provide for this church as we are obedient. So we just have to be faithful with what God's blessed us with. <coughs> but God pours out grace. So grace, back to where I was coming with this, is I probably learned it as a youth. But it was an acronym. It was probably one of those lessons or somewhere in there. I heard it. Grace is an acronym that stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. Great picture there. God's riches comes to us out of heaven through what Jesus Christ did for us in giving his life for us, dying on the cross, paying for our sins, redeeming us out of slavery to sin, 
by putting our faith in what Jesus Christ did to pay for our sins and to set us free. And so you've been singing some of those songs. I've got three more songs that I'm going to read and one that maybe I'll get you to sing with me, one I've sung before. And so you're going to help me with that because as we, we leave this place, as we leave out of here, what is the purpose? Is that you have, exper you have experienced God's grace. You are experiencing God's grace and you will continue to experience God's grace because grace is what brings us salvation. It is through the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, that we have salvation. And so we need to know that when we walk out of here, God is still providing you from heaven through Jesus Christ, even though you step outside the four walls of this building, get in your car, drive in the spot where you're fine. Now I'm stuck. You are not stuck if you're in Jesus Christ. You are not in bondage if you have been set free from what she, by what Jesus Christ did for you as you've turned and repented and given Christ first place. I give you a testimony yesterday. We were we went with some friends uh, on the little. We did this last year. We loved it, so we did it this year. But uh, last year I was gone the weekend. This week I, I came back and I want to preach uh, today. And um, and so we were sitting in this van to haul us all up. There's four couples, and we're sitting in this van with our kayaks in the back of this trailer. And they were pulling us off. We were so excited, you know. And it's be on the White River and it's freezing cold and two of the guys were going to fish for trout and that kind of stuff. And just everybody's excited. We got in the van and it's just like this quiet moment and Teresa's phone started going off. It was 9.38. My phone was already in a little waterproof bag and back in our kayak and hers was going off and one of our guys, one of our guys, and they're all smart out of guys. Okay, I'm not, not that I'm not, but they were all, and someone said something about that little tune of hers going off at 9.38. Now, if you've been with us this year, you know that 938 is tied to something I've, I brought a message to back early on this year. And so I could have done, I could have just laughed along with it, but I was sitting there right next to, I was sitting in the front because I was the oldest guy. Not really, but that's what they kept laughing. So I had to sit in the front with the, with our driver. And so he's sitting there, I hear them all cut up, and, and they, and whatever remark I said, well, you know, it is kind of a cute green tone, but you know what it's for? I could have been silent. And I don't think it's because of a preacher. I think it's just, we can decide to be silent when we have the opportunity to witness or not. And I just said, that's, you know, that's 938. And they said, what? Yes, Matthew 938. It tells us, Jesus said that, you know, the, the field is white into harvest. There's lots of people that need to be saved. And it's big field, but the problem is we don't have enough laborers. This is a 2,000 year old and beyond need in the church, in the kingdom work. And so I said, so we are called, Jesus said, you are called to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send out laborers. And so I just said, and so that's what we're doing as a church family. We are praying at night because I said, man, I said, God is blessing. There's people that are coming to church and there's boys and girls and there's, and there's, there's uh, adults and families coming to different places. And so God's sending people and there's people out in our community. So we're praying for laborers. And all, we, all weekend long, one of these guys, J.R. Donnelly, you know him. J.R. has been talking about, man, I just can't get anybody that can do the work with this little business he's got going on. Besides this other business where he works for the Donnellys, he is a Donnelly. And so all the, I guess I can't, I'm sorry, J.R., if you're watching, I'm talking about you. Because they could be listening in as, I'm, as they're driving back. He says, well, can I use that prayer for my workplace? He says, because I need some laborers. I need somebody. I said, I just need some people to. And his son, who's got a business going on in Oklahoma City, is really blooming. He's doing all these cases and I've got all the other loaves and stuff like that, taking care of them. So he's just really blessed. And his hardest part is he can't get enough workers. Can I just tell him? He can't get enough workers to come do it. And so his dad, gave great, JR, said to him, uh, which one was it? Um, is Teresa still in the building? Yes. You remember who that was? She's probably back there in the nursery. Um, and, and whichever boy it is in Oklahoma City. He said, I told my son, go pick up some of those homeless people, pick them up, take them with you, and, and then tell them what they need to do. And then if they, if they will really want to work, they'll be back the next day. And he's found some people by just doing his dad's advice. Older man, although he's just 47 now, teaching his younger son, 
how to find some workers because he said, I can't find anybody. And so he's been using homeless people to go do the work that they're doing. Not highly qualified, but they do the work. And the ones that want to show up next day will be there. He's, so he looks at me and JR looks at me and said, Kim, is that, I like that prayer, praying for the laborers. Can you find one about quality of laborers too? <laughs> said, I'll, I'll look for that. But actually I told him, I said, JR, that's your job because you're a believer now. You got saved at Easter time. I said, you're a believer now. You need to look in the scriptures. You'll find some of us. I said, well, the bottom line is one thing that we always know is that God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Don't be out there saying, well, I can't work with boys, or I can't do this, I can't. No, if God's calling you, then you step up and do what God's calling you to do, and he will qualify you and put people around you so that you're not, you're, you're not just floundering. So you'll put some others. And it's all because of the grace of God that's poured out through Jesus Christ. I, I, I can't preach long today because we're running out of time. I've been saying, okay, Lord, i got to quit preaching so long. And I realize we've been doing other stuff. Yeah, you help this time. But they never remember because it's at the end of the service. No matter how long we go, it's always a preacher's fault for going too long. So I've been going on now for about 13 minutes. Okay? Only 13 minutes. So Paul says this. In, in chapter 2 of Titus, I hope you found that. In verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared with salvation for all people. I love that. For all people, instructing us to deny godless, godlessness. It may say ungodliness. To try to translate a Greek word that basically says, to de he says, instructing us to deny anything that says that God does not exist. Godlessness. Is our world in its teachings, it, they deny that God exists. What's your favorite? Go through your favorite TV show that you're hooked on right now and see how many times that there's reference to God that is out of the scripture. It's not mocking God or in your stories that you watch where God is even mentioned. I'm not talking about church. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about where God is even mentioned in the shows. I'm not talking about Sunday school. I'm not about the lessons you're teaching. I'm not talking about going specifically to find on some particular streaming service where it's all about like Chosen or something like that. I'm talking about those other shows that you may watch. Uh, football, guys. This is football season. All three of our teams in the state of Oklahoma, my team actually won. And so all three of you, all of how many times did you hear him reference God? Is God a, well, Brother Paul, God doesn't, God doesn't have a place in sports. God doesn't have a place in politics. Can we not refer to God? And he says, you need to, first of all, he says, salvation of God, this grace of God instructs us. So I put in the title, Grace Works. Grace of God is not just a big treasure chest that we go to and dig out for what we need on a daily basis as a believer or in Christ. But grace of God teaches and instructs us to deny godliness and to deny worldly lusts and to, and it tells us three things we're supposed to do. So the grace of God, we are supposed to remember that it is telling us to deny God. So we should be positively teaching in our world that God exists. If we don't teach that God exists and he reigns in our life and we're not following what God's word teaching us, then we're going to do what the world's doing right now. For when you take out God out of your life or out of his influence in our world, then we will be in this category says, of worldly lust. And I would refer you to Romans chapter 1, great picture of what a world is like when we deny God and we make up our own God and then we deny God and make up our own God and then eventually we just ignore it, even say anything about God. So we get rid of religion or focus on God and we just do what we want to do and we see where it goes and you've got 
men and women and your homes, you've got to read Romans 1 to understand where we are today in this world. It's a whole other passage, and it is not woke. It is not politically correct, but it is exactly what God's world would want us to know because God does exist, and our world is acting like there is no such individual person called God. We cannot have the grace from God and deny the existence of God. Amen. And the grace of God teaches us to deny godlessness and to deny worldly lusts and to live in. Here's the three things for today. There's so much more in here. Three things for today. We are to live in a sensible. That is an idea that we are uh, self-controlled. So in relation, the grace of God gives us the ability and shows us how to live in a sensible way, self-controlled, not trying to take control of our lives our way, but we are to live in a sensible, self-controlled way of living. We are to live, that's our personal walk with Christ. And in righteous is our relationship to other people. We are to live in the way that God calls us to live in relationship to in our homes, with our with our spouses, with our children, with those that live under our authority, as he just got through talking to Titus about the home life and the slaves and everything else. We are to live in a way that it is righteous, honoring God, serving others. Serving in such a way that we don't run out of the ability to love. To be humble, to have empowerment, to seek and to hear others, because the grace of God instructs us on how to be sensible and how to be righteous. Pouring out from heaven through what Jesus Christ did for us. So we are to live grace teaching us and teaching us the godly way in this present age. So as we come to a time of honoring God, a time of worship of God, we know we have a relationship ourselves with God, we have a relationship with others, and we have a responsibility to bring glory to God. And we are to honor Him. And so our grace that we receive Christ enables us to worship Him. Do you understand how much grace is a part of your life. I've got three songs, and then I'm going to wrap it up with the last part of that, that passage there. Three songs. Now, we start out in our service with uh, hymns, and then we uh, go to praises. Uh, kind of more contemporary stuff, I guess, if you want to say it that way. So I'm going to back this up and do it where we started just a minute ago. There's a song out by now called Walking Free. It's kind of catchy tune. You'll like it if you've heard it by Micah Taylor, Tyler, and I think it's also was recorded by um, uh, West, Michael W. West as well. Uh, they helped compose this. The verdict was guilty. Case closed the end. No chance for me to ever leave this prison of my sin. Now, I know it might sound crazy, but one day, a key unlocked the cell. I heard a small voice say, your debts have been paid by somebody else. Now I'm walking, walking, walking free. No more darkness. Guilt has lost its grip on me. When mercy called my name, those chains fell at my feet. And now I'm walking, walking, walking free. Now I ain't nothing perfect. I still stumble, still stumble every single day. I still get knocked down, but the difference now is that's not where I stay because I've got a Savior who knows everywhere I've been and he's telling me that I never have to go back there again. So I'm now I'm walking, walking, walking free. No more darkness. Guilt has lost its grip on me. When mercy called my name, those chains fell at my feet. And now I'm walking, walking, walking free. Walking free. You gotta listen to that song. It's a great song. It's catchy. It's fun. It's fast. It's energized by the grace of that he's trying to capture and put into words for us. Oh, but for all of you that say, oh, I don't listen to new stuff because it's kind of old, kind of, you know, that's not, that's not me. So if you like these hymns, which are basically like this, just 
you know, 100 or so years, or 200, or 300, or 400, or 800 years old, okay? Even though those tunes don't always translate into something that we want to sing, the words many times capture grace. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him, no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Once I was lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation. Lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to him. Joy floods my soul, for Jesus has saved me. Freed me from sin that long had enslaved me. His precious blood he gave to redeem. Now I belong, I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. Now for years of time alone, but for eternity. Now I belong to Jesus. And Paul says to Titus, he gives him instruction to say to those in that, those churches in, in uh, Crete, on Crete, and he says to him, as he's telling him the grace of God and what it works in our life, how it instructs us, and then he says, while we wait for the, and we sang it in the song just a minute ago, while we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. One of those, one of those spots in the scripture where it's definitely saying Jesus is God. Hear what the Apostle Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit, says. Many times we'll say, well, I, some people tell you out there, well, I don't know that Jesus was God. The Apostle Paul, empowered by the Holy Spirit, in Titus chapter 2, verse uh, 13, says, while we wait for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Jesus is Savior. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. He is our great God, and the glory of God is going to shine into our lives, both now when we come to worship Him, or when we think about when we were saved and set free, or when we long for the day. Our hope is that that is certain. It's not a hope our, our team's going to win. It is certain, it is affixed in the person of Jesus Christ that one day we will be with Him forever. Now I belong to him right now and for all eternity. And so when we hear these words and we see them in our life, we are reminded, as Paul says to Titus, he, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us, to buy us back. That word redeem is you were a slave. You are right now, if you're not in Christ, you are a slave to sin. But when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you've been set free because he's redeemed you from all lawlessness and to cleanse for himself a people for his own possession, eager, eager, hear this, eager to do good works, not to be saved, but because you are redeemed. You, you are saved. You are being transformed. And one day you will be, you will be glorified and brought into the very presence of God. Because he paid a debt, Jesus. He paid a debt he did not owe. I, you, we owe the debt we could not pay. I needed someone to take my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song. Amazing grace the whole day long. Christ Jesus paid a debt. That I could never pay. Amen. The songs that bring joy to our heart are the songs the joy to our heart, not just a song from your past, not just some country song that you would tap along to and think, wow, that's a cool song. Listen to the words. The ones that make the difference in our life are the songs and the tunes and the words that focus our hearts on what Jesus Christ has done and what he's done for you and for me and what he continues to do and what he is calling us to do. So God's called us to live as believers 
knowing that the grace of God, the riches of God flow into our lives because of what Christ did for us. Grace. And he's calling you and he's calling me to live with that as a part of our life, not to live in a world full of bad news or turning off the news, but to speak the good news. Yes, the fields are white to harvest. Yes, we need to put on our phones 938 or find your scripture that God put on your heart so that we may praise God, whether you be on a van doing something recreationally, going out, going kayaking with some friends, or whether you're going on the way to church, or whether you're in the midst of a crisis, that that song plays in your heart that Jesus Christ lives. He is alive, and he gave his life for you. And so you know one day your destiny will be fulfilled when you walk in the presence of God, and you walk into heaven, and you'll be like, it was worth it. Come on. So that's what we're called to do. Give your life to Christ. If you've not, come today. Come to Jesus Christ. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, quit living like you're bankrupt. Because you have all the riches of the Father flowing through Jesus Christ. Quit trying to live on your own efforts. And live in the grace and the faith that Jesus gives you. You will. And you're going to have to deny godlessness. And you're going to have to quit walking the worldly lusts, but you're going to have to walk sensibly. You're going to have to live sensibly as the grace teaches you. You're going to have to relate to other people righteously. And you're going to have to live in the glory of God shining through His Word and His Spirit as you serve Him in this world. What's God calling you to do today? What's He asking you to do? Can you come to Him? You may want to come and pray. Some of the things that God's been speaking to you about. You may want to come and pray. You may want to come and receive Christ. I still don't see my light. So I'm going to let someone out late that soon. If you want to come and join me here. Okay? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time now to respond to what you've been speaking to our hearts. Lord, you have brought all these people here today for this moment in their life. You place them to hear from you in different ways, in different things, and your Spirit has spoken into their hearts and to their minds about what they need to, to respond to. Father, I just pray that they respond to your calling and your leading them and let them know that you will provide what need, is needed to be done if they will just take the step of faith, of prayer, of witness, of praising Jesus. Oh Lord, call your people in such a way that they see the Spirit's going before them and the Spirit's prompting them away. It's in Christ's name. Lord's calling you. Come right now. So you stand to see You come. Come right now. Come right now. Come. got to be willing to come to Jesus. If you can't come all the way up here, then don't leave. I'll be at the back. Uh, but there's some other believers that are around you. Just go talk to them. They'll step up. They'll talk to you. They'll pray for you. Don't leave without having peace. We're, in a, we're, we're seeing one more verse, okay? The Lord's speaking to you. He said, Brother Paul, quit looking at me. I promise you, I'm looking all over the place. <laughs> I promise you. 
If, if you feel like I'm looking at you right now, what is it? Conviction. All right, let's sing. Come. Oh, Jesus, I surrender. some young man over here, over there singing that, because Gary's going to teach them, hey, when we sing some of these songs, there's that spot where some of these, these voices come out. Because <sighs> you know why? Because it's that second, it's that little repeat where everybody's singing it, and then, then Gary sings that one little spot where we're all here and go, oh God, that's, you're telling me to go, I've got to go. You know, it's that little spot. It is. Man. Y'all are going to do it because God's given you his grace through his son, Jesus Christ. Let God fill your hearts with the good news of Jesus Christ. And that grace will flow out in such a way that you're going to touch people's lives this week. And you're going to bring them help. And you're going to bring that, like I did this the other day. And he's going to say, Brother Paul. Do you have a verse for me if I get some quality workers at work? I said, prayer. Keep praying. All right, so let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, we taught a young man, uh, Paul and I taught a young man to pray in front of about nine girls. And all we did was we just had him read the Lord's Prayer. And he said, oh, I can't pray in front of them. They said, really? I'm nervous. I said, so we just had him look up Matthew chapter 6. In verse 9, he did the Lord's Prayer. He said, You just pray in front of all these girls. And he did. And I said, Paul, what does it feel like when when uh, he says, I'm nervous when you call? And he knows I'm prepping because I'm getting ready to call him to pray. And I said, He says, I'm a little nervous when you call. I said, I said, Well, sometimes they give you an advance notice. I said, But usually when I do that, then the guys left the building. You know? <laughs> so that's why I wait till the end. But, uh, but Paul says, You know what? I, I just pray from my heart about what God's laying on. Well, that's all you do. It's, it's not something that you make up. It's not even always everything that you memorize. It's just saying, God, you taught me this today, and I just want to thank you. So, Brother Paul, would you uh, close us in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for being able to get here today, Lord, and being with us as we go through our week. Thank you for the, the word that's, uh, the message that has been taught here, Lord, through, through your word, through these people, Lord. And, you can guide and direct us all towards, towards your will, Lord, and uh, help us in these younger, younger generations, Lord. Have us be an influence on them through you, Lord. And give us strength to persevere through these trials and tribulations, Lord. We stay strong in you, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.